In John chapter 13, Jesus tells us this, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is a, a scripture that I've memorized and the Holy Spirit just keeps bringing it back to my mind day after day, often throughout the day, because Jesus has given us this new command, a, a command that, that really sums up all the law and all the prophets, everything that God has given us in, in the Bible is really summed up in, in this, the command of love, the law of love, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. But Jesus worded it this way, a new command. I give you love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Well, love wasn't the new command. Love had had been there from the beginning. God was always telling us to love him and to love people. The new command was this, that, that now we can love with the love of Jesus. We're not loving with a love that, that we manifest on our own or that is somehow derived out of our effort and work, but rather his love is poured into us. So his love can move out of us. We are filled to the measure of all the fullness with the spirit of God so that his love not only comes in, but can move out. A new command, love one another. He says, as I have loved you and his love is sacrificial and his love is generous and his love is forgiving and his love is powerful and his love is strong and his love is unending. His love is perfect. And perfect love drives out fear. There's so much fear that, that goes on and, and just destroys our relationships. We have the fear of being taken advantage of, the fear of being hurt, the fear of being rejected, the fear of being alone. So much fear comes in and, and destroys our relationships, but God's love drives out that fear. And now we have this new command to love one another as he has loved us, so we must and that must is such a cool word. We're compelled. We can't help it. We just, we have to. This command and this law of love. You see, this is what it means to really connect for, uh, to really, to really win and, and live the abundant life that God has for us. It's a life of love. So we go back to pray for one. Let's look at it. When we pray for one, uh, we connect to God. We understand who we are, that we're saying, all right, well, wait a minute, God, I am created by you to be in a relationship with you. Now, what does that relationship look like? Well, it's a worship relationship. We're aware of who he is and that he's present and that he is greater than us. And, and so we're yielding to him. We're being open to, to his love coming into us so that his love can move through us. God, please give me one person to share your love with. Not my love, but his love. And his love moves through us to people. Well, which people? Well, all people. When we pray for one, there are some ones, specific names that God lays on our hearts. Also the, the specific some ones that we're in closest relationship with are our family and friends and neighbors and coworkers and classmates. But then we become aware well, it could be anyone anyone at any time uh, who might I have the opportunity to share God's love with, to, to touch, to serve, to, to help, to encourage. And then we realize, well, it's everyone. That God has strategically placed me in my world to share his love. And we connect to people and that ultimately connects us to the, the mission of Jesus. Jesus came to save the world for God so loved the world. He sent his one and only son, Jesus not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And this is a mission of love. These are relationships built on love. And it's a love connection with the father that then moves through us. And so as we think about what it means to, to really connect four, to have all four in place, who I am, who I, how I relate to God, how I relate to people and to the mission of Jesus, then I would say a place where this love connection often fails is right there right there with people and not just any people, but at home, our marriages and with our siblings and our parents, with our children, with our extended families and with the people who live across the street or next door. There is a, a break and, and something is, is tragically broken when that connection isn't there. Yeah, I may know who I am and I may be connecting to God and his love's coming into me, but if it's not flowing through me, then 
there's a real problem there. And here's the issue with that particular problem is when his love isn't moving through us, then something is broken. This is really the the issue that I I believe the the world has with the church, with the family of God. Something is off. Something is wrong. And maybe they don't know how to say it, but they're going, well, something's wrong here. It's kind of like when you hear about major moral failure, major moral failure within the, within the church. Usually when, when you talk about major moral failure within the church, there's, there's one of three things that someone in leadership in the church is guilty of doing. Uh, usually it has to do with money. They were stealing church finances or, or it's sex. They were, they were engaging in sexual sin or, or abusing others sexually or it's power. Abusing others or, or the power that they have or are causing damage and hurt to others. We would call these three things major moral failure, but I would say there's a fourth that supersedes all three of those. And that is when we fail to love, that is the greatest major moral failure. And yet we've allowed it to run rampant in the church. As opposed to saying, wait, something's off here. There is a lack of love and something is missing. Instead of loving like Jesus loves, we start to love, love like the world loves, conditionally, with strings attached. Love that that fails and stops and love that isn't powerful or strong, but is weak and temporary and fleeting. It's fickle. And yet, instead of relying on the love God has for us and has given us, we somehow accept it. And that, my friends, is a major moral failure. What if we love different, like with a crazy love? Which brings us to our memory verse. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13. Listen to these words. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. You see, as we become less like the world that we live in and the way our world pretends or or tries, I I think there's there's an effort there to love, but instead we're out of our minds because we're so connected to God and his love is coming into us, but now we're in our right mind for the people that his love is moving through us to. What a powerful and wonderful way to live. And so when it comes to connecting with people, And as we pray for one, I would tell you this, you you can't love God and hate people. This just, this just doesn't work. This is a, a, like a a deal stopper right there. You, You can't love God and hate people. And yet we've allowed this kind of mindset to take place within our our churches and with our communities and inside our families to go, well, yeah, I love God and I love most people, but you know, I, I hate her. I hate him. I, well, I don't, I I don't hate a specific person. I just hate a type of people or maybe uh, an entire nationality or a type of people who think or believe differently than I do. My friends, that is not of God and that is not okay. You can't love God and and hate people. The two cannot coexist. It just doesn't work. Hate is a dominant emotion. The other thing about hate is we think, no, I can direct hate. It's fine. I'm going to love God. And yeah, I love my spouse and I'll love my kids and I'll love the people that I like to love, but I'm I'm, I'm just going to hate one person. The problem with this is, is not only are we hating that one person, but that hate begins to seep into every other relationship and it's off, it's broken. There's a disconnect. You can't love God and hate people. Let's look at this scripture in 1 John chapter four, verse seven, it says, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Oh, dear friends, let us love one another because love comes from God. So here's the deal. If we do not love, then we don't know God. Everything is broken there. You can't love God and hate people. So if we're hating someone, there's a disconnect there where we're not connected to God and we're not connected to who we are, that we are created by God in love to be in a loving relationship with him. And the whole thing is off. 
And so here's the, the thing about love and the way God loves. Uh, God's love flows. This is how he intends for it to work. God, please give me one person to share your love with. Well, you cannot share what you don't have. So if you don't have God's love, you can't share God's love. And so as we open ourselves up, we say, well, God, I, I want to share your love, not mine, but, but yours. The way you love. God, I want to love with your love like you love. And his love flows. It flows from God to, through us to others. His love flows. Now, if it's, if it's not flowing, then we've erected a, like a dam in our hearts. We've set something up and said, okay, now I'm going to prevent or stop the flow of God's love. There are all kinds of reasons that we try to do this, but whenever we do it, something is broken. The abundant life that Jesus has for us is, is not being lived out. His love flows. God, please give me one person to share your love with. Would you pray that with me right now? Let's do it out loud together. God, please give me one person to share your love with. Yeah. Well, his love's going to flow into you, through you, to others. And our world is in desperate need of the love of God. And his love is available to you to move through you to others. So you can't love God and hate people. Now, maybe right now you're going, well, I, I, I don't hate people. I mean, what do, am I a monster? I know I'm not supposed to hate people. I don't hate people. And maybe you've moved on from hate and, you know, like, like moved to a higher plane, right? I, I don't hate people. Maybe you just ignore people. Well, I would say this. You can't love God and ignore people. What I mean by ignore is just to deny their existence, to not look at them, to pretend like they're, they're not even in your, your worldview, to avert your eyes. I mean, you know what it feels like, like, uh, like when you see somebody who is begging for money and you're, you're pulling up to that stoplight and you're trying to make the decision, what am I going to do? God, what do you want me to do? Is, is helping hurting or, or, or should I help? Or God, what's happening here? And you're not quite sure what to do or what love looks like in that moment. And so you just look the other way. And now that, that person doesn't even exist anymore because I can't see them. They're not, they're not in my worldview anymore. And we drive on and we go about our days. Well, it's just a microcosm of the way we so often try to live, ignoring those who are difficult to love, ignoring those who maybe don't reciprocate love the way we would like to be loved, ignoring those who, who maybe we've assigned value to them based on the projected return on our love investment. This would be the way the world loves. I love you as long as there's a return on my love investment. Are you loving me in return or not? If not, then, well, I must move on because this relationship isn't, isn't working anymore. The love of God is so different. The love of God is so powerful and strong when his love is, is moving in us and, and then through us to others. Now we have a love that is so powerful and strong. It's enough. It's sufficient. And so you can't love God and ignore others. Let's jump back into that first John text. First John chapter four, verse nine, it says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is how God demonstrates his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus would come and die for us. God loves us so much that he sent his son. God became flesh and he has made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father, full of grace and truth. He came so that we might live and love through him. And he didn't ignore you. Praise be to God. Maybe you didn't even know that yet. God's not ignoring you. 
Maybe you think he can't, can't see you or he doesn't care about you or he's disinterested in you or he's written you off or he's given up on you because of the things you've done or the things you neglected to do or the, the things that have been done to you or the, the burdens and the hurt and the pain that you carry. Maybe you think God's just gone, yeah, you're dead to me. No, you're not. He sees you and he looks at you and he loves you. And this is the love that is now available to you and to me, to every one of us that we can share with others. And so we can't love God and hate people. We also can't love God and ignore people because love is active. Love is active. Maybe you've heard it said this way, love, love is a verb. It's not an emotion. It's not a thought. It is an active choice, a decision. Love is active. So what does love and action look like? Well, it is intentional. You make up your mind and you say, no, I am going to love with God's love. And anything that runs contrary to that, it sets off the alarms in us, our, our spiritual alarms that go, bing, 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 something's off, something's off, problem, problem, what's happening here? Why am I ignoring this other person? Why am I avoiding this person? Something's off here. Why am I denying love to this person? Love's intentional. It makes a choice, a decision. Love is costly. There's a cost involved. I, I know when it comes to, to love, we're all like, oh, love. Yeah, love just kind of takes care of itself. No, it doesn't. Love is active and requires work and, and dedication. And there, there's a cost to love. Uh, the cost that, that God paid for, for us was he gave his one and only son, Jesus. And so as, as we follow Jesus, he invites us to share in that as we lay down our lives and take up our crosses and follow him to love like he loves with his love. That's costly. It is unconditional. It doesn't, doesn't stop. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about not having uh, boundaries based on godly wisdom. Uh, sometimes we, we can do harm to, to other people um, by allowing things to continue that, that shouldn't continue. That's, that's not love. But we don't deny or reject love or even punish relationally. It's not a punishment, but rather, hey, you know what? This isn't healthy for you. And I really believe this, that, that God's love can transform us to such a degree that, that we can live like that and we can love like that. It doesn't mean everybody will always understand it or it'll always make sense, but we're not hating people or ignoring them. Rather, we're actively loving them unconditionally and it is redemptive. Instead of just kicking people out and writing them off, washing our hands of them, uh, having some kind of mindset that says, well, essentially, well, you are dead to me. No, it's redemptive. The love God has for us is redemptive. Then doesn't mean that we get to always be the ones who, who have that place in another person's life that may be someone else, but in our own hearts, we can be free so that there's no block, there's no disconnect, but love is always moving through us and we're not denying it to anyone. Can't love God and hate people. Can't love God and ignore people. And the next one is, you can't love God and hide God from people. You can't do it. This love relationship with God is not something that is kind of done on the sly. It's not done in the shadows. This is, this is light. You, you are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill. You are the love representation of God. You are his love expression to your world your home, your family, your neighbors and coworkers and classmates, your community, your world, the way they're going to receive God's love is through you. And so we can't hide his love from others. Back into that first John text, verse 11. It says, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Oh, I just want you to think about that. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, 
God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. The, the completion of God's love is the sharing of God's love. As his love moves through us, we are objects of God's love and recipients of God's love. But now we've become participants in God's love. His love moves from God through us to others. And as we love with the love of God, God is revealed to our world and they can see him. And the Bible talks a lot about how we are to love one another. Uh, maybe you've, you've heard this before, uh, this, the, this acronym or these initials, PDA, PDA, public displays of affection. I don't know how you feel about these. Like some people are like, oh, and other people are like, yeah, yeah, you know, let's hold hands, let's snuggle, let's hug, let's kiss, whatever, you know, public displays of affection. How can you tell people like, like really in love with one another or love one another? Well, the Bible for, for Christians unpacks this for us. What does it look like for us to love one another? It's full of these one another's, I'll, I'll give them to you. A public display of affection would be to encourage one another. Encourage people. There's, there's plenty of discouragement in our world. It's all over the place. Uh, enough of that going around already. Uh, we get to be encouragers. It encourage people to know who they are and who God is and how they can love one another. Encourage one another. And, and, like, and like right now, if God lays somebody, we've already prayed for one, God, please give me one person to share your love with. Well, part of that may be, who can you encourage today? If when, we, when that came up on the, the screen there, you, a, a name or a face popped into your mind, encourage that person. Make the phone call, send the text, uh, do something, reach out to them, encourage them. Uh, another public display of affection would be to admonish one another. The word admonish here means to correct. I mean, lovingly, it's in love. It's, it's never mean-spirited. It's always for the purpose of restoration. Uh, but sometimes it's like, hey, you may not see this. But this is what, I'm, maybe you have a blind spot here. But here's, here's what God is saying. And, and here's another way to do this and another approach to this and, and to correct, to love one another enough to do this. A lot of times we deny this love because we're hoping nobody will ever return the favor. What I mean by that is, if something in my, in my life is off, I might not be willing to lovingly admonish others because they might lovingly admonish me. And I would rather continue in the direction I'm going than make a change. That's not love. That's not, that's major moral failure. We admonish one another. We uh, serve one another. The son of man, Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve others. And so oh, we take on a, a servant's heart that puts others' needs ahead of our own and, and we look to, to serve them. We're to forgive one another. And as we've talked about many times as a, as a church, it doesn't necessarily mean forgive and forget. That's not what it, it's not what I mean. Forgive, yes. Forget, no, maybe. I mean, I, I know this. The more we forgive, the harder it is to remember. But those wounds, those things, that, that what, what has happened, even the appropriate boundaries and, and safeguards and, and guardrails in our lives, they need to be there, but forgive, yeah. I'm not gonna hold this against you. I will forgive. To be hospitable to one another. To, to give, to share, to, to open our hearts and our homes, our lives, to share our lives with people, which sometimes is, is finances, sometimes it's, it's provision, uh, sometimes it's something practical and tangible, uh, sometimes it's, it's just relationally connecting and, and letting something interrupt what you had, had scheduled to love another person, to bear one another's burdens, to actually listen and, and love other people enough to to help walk with them and, and carry the, the burdens that they're carrying. Another part of that would be to share our burdens with others. To stop pretending like we're so self-sufficient that we don't need anyone. We do. 
need people. I know sometimes we go, well, all I need is God. That's not true. I mean, yes, all things flow from him. So I suppose intellectually, we might be able to get there to where all I need is God and he'll provide everything else. But we need people. We need relationships and people need us and it's okay. To bear one another's burdens, to come alongside and and walk with people in that. That's what that looks like. And then to spur one another on. It, it, this moves beyond just encouraging into like, yeah, go. You can, you, you can do it, go. Uh, like, like a push, like, like wind beneath them, uh, lifting them up, like, yeah, go. Adding some momentum and some force behind them. In our competitive cultural worldview and mindset, instead of spurring others on, oftentimes we try to hold them back. It happens in families and friendships all the time. Instead of celebrating and, and cheering on and, and being that, that inspiration and breath of fresh air, it's almost like, oh, well, if you're spurred on, then I might be left behind. So maybe we don't even just refuse to do that. We, we could even try to hold them back. But when we love one another, it, it spurs them on. And so this love connection and connect four, I'm going to give you one more thought on that. You can't love God and reject his power to love people. All right, so you can't love God and hate people. You can't love God and ignore people. You can't love God and hide God from people. And you can't love God and reject his power to love people. It is his love moving through us. And when you have his love, you must love others. You must. Back in 1 John chapter 4, verse 13, continuing in our text, it says, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent the son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. If it, if it feels like this, this scripture text from first John is a bit repetitive and maybe a bit redundant. That's because it is because I think God is trying to give us the same message over and over and over again. He's giving us power and authority to love. And so if that's the case, not, not to just love with a worldly love, but with a godly love, a love that has power to transform and, and a love that has, that has power to heal and, and a love that has power to help others to connect to God. How broken are we when we make a choice to reject the power of God's love in us. If you have a relationship with Jesus, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. God has transformed your core identity. You're an adopted child into his family, a son or daughter chosen by him. And you belong with him. This has been declared and this has been done. It is finished. Jesus took care of this for you on the cross when your sin and mine and the sin of all of humanity was put to death in his body and buried with him in the tomb. And when he rose victoriously, defeating sin and death, rose into new life so that we can now not only share in his death, burial, but also in his resurrection and the new life that is present right now. We're not simply waiting around, muddling through, existing until we can get to heaven. Heaven is here. You have a room in his house and a seat at his table and his love is in you. And his love can move through you to someone, to anyone, to everyone. And if you pray, God, please give me one person to share your love with. This is no small prayer. <laughs> this is a prayer of power. Don't deny that power. You can't share what you don't have, but 
you receive God's love, now you're responsible to share God's love. And so right now, right where you are, I would, I would ask this question. Do you have God's love? Have you said yes to this invitation that, that comes through Jesus uh, to be a part of his family, to not just be a recipient, but then a participant in sharing his love? Well, why not right now? Yes, God, I need your love. Maybe you feel like you've never been loved like that. You don't even know necessarily what it looks like. It's, say, God, I, I want to receive your love. Show me your love and let me receive it. I'm saying yes to you. I'm going to live under your authority and under your lordship. Or maybe you have been hating someone or a group of people or a type of people. And today's a day of repentance to change your mind. No, no, this, this isn't right. This isn't what God has for me. Confess that to God. Or if you're not sure, but there, there's a lingering doubt, ask him, say, God, search me, show me. Who am I hating? Or maybe you've just been ignoring someone, a coworker, a neighbor, an old friend, a family member. And the Holy Spirit is stirring inside of you, convicting your heart because you've written that person off. Here's an opportunity to repent. To say, God, please love that person through me. Show me what that looks like and, and let me love them, not, not ignoring them. Let me see them. Let me love actively. And then maybe God will reveal his love through you. And there's someone, you know, that doesn't have a relationship with God yet. Pray for that person by name. That God would love you through, love you and his love would come through you to them. So right now I want to just give us a little space and time to talk to God and let him do his love work in us as we connect with him or reconnect. And this love connection let it be a, a crazy love. A love like maybe your world has never seen before. But a love that is powerful. Let's pray together. Father, thank you uh, for your love. And Lord, let us know and rely on your love. We ask that we would receive your love and we would share your love. Please give us one. And we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen.